My name is Blair Williams, and I am a creative placemaker. And I'm so excited to finally have a name to this thing that I've always been doing. This is a new, relatively new field, if you will, when it comes to a title. Really, the, the term creative placemaking is maybe three years old. But for many of us, it's what we've been intrinsically doing in our communities for centuries. And it's nice to see that there's finally a movement behind it. So what is creative placemaking? Well, creative placemaking is when members of a community come together and they use arts and cultural strategies to enact change and investment into a place or a space. Usually, that change is brought to a place or a space that we might consider blighted. Now, here's the part where my husband last night said, you've got to describe blighted better. <laughs> blighted is not a space that is falling apart, that is necessarily economically impoverished, that is, is uh, lacking in water or roads. Blighted districts can be some place that's just not engaged, that doesn't have that life force or that energy that's really causing it to be a special and memorable place that we want to visit or go or use. And that's why I enjoy creative placemaking. I love bringing that energy, not my energy, but the authentic energy of the people who are going to use that space and enact it and grow it and make it change and make it special for where they live. So I want to give you a couple of examples of creative placemaking that I've been a part of and that were really fun and memorable, but also really easy and cheap. The first one, when preparing for your speech, you know you have to have words that sort of help you remind your sections, remember your sections or your transition words. And I got to thinking as I was teaching myself this section uh, or remembering it, the four words for me were chairs, music, film, and asking permission. Now, for those of you who know me well, if you see a few of you here in the, uh, in the audience, I don't like asking permission. And I even like asking forgiveness more. So, <laughs> so I like to just go in and get stuff done and hope that it is meaningful. That's a great part of creative placemaking. So back in 2008, I and some investor partners purchased a building in downtown Helena, Montana. I don't know if you heard this, but 2008 was not a great time to buy a piece of real estate <laughs> and think that you would invest in it and turn it into, let's say, uh, livable space. But we did so. And why did I do this? Well, I had done a building a few months earlier. I had taken on a, the redevelopment of a project. And the truth is, it was a building that my husband and I would pass for about seven years. And every time we would pass by it, I would say, you know, somebody oughta. You know, that's a great space if somebody would just. And one day, looking out the window of my office at this old brick building, four stories high, in what would be considered a blighted district. I called my husband and I said, I think we're going to do that building. And he said, do you have an account I don't know about? <laughs> I said, I think I can figure this out. Now, that particular project I'm not going to talk about, it became sort of my master's degree, if you will, in what to do and what not to do, <laughs> which is always a good, it's always good to have those projects. But because of the energy that I brought to that district and through that building, by the way, I'm an arts administrator and I owned a public relations firm, not a developer. But the energy that I was able to bring to that district and began to see that district changed created an opportunity wherein owners of another building reached out to me and said, we no longer want to own our space. We've been partners for a number of years. We'd like to move on. And we only want to hand it off to somebody who has great energy and great ideas. And we think that you are the person. Now, again, I work in the arts and I am a public, I worked in public relations. I didn't have a lot of money. This was a $4 million building. But lo and behold, I was able to put it together. But why did I take on this project? Because it was in a blighted district. That was the part that excited me. So this was a, uh, an area in downtown where they had blocked off the street in the 1970s to create a walking mall, hoping that it would create this vibrancy and excitement. The problem is, it didn't, because the culture at that time was driven, no pun intended, by their automobiles and where they could pull right up to. And so this became a space that people just traversed through. 
and could hardly wait to get to the next place. It wasn't anything special. So a few days after we purchased the building, I began the process of asset mapping, which is my favorite part of creative placemaking. And it's when you go out and you determine what are those things that we already have, or what are those things that are at our disposal that we can instigate and cultivate and energize to make this space what it needs to be. So I stood for a few moments in front of the, the building out on the walking mall and I said, we've got pocket parks. They're already here, beautiful trees. We even have a space right next door to the building where a building once stood but had burned down and the city had invested in redeveloping it into a stage and a performance center. But there were never any performances there because people didn't know how to use public space. That's a great part of creative placemaking, is reminding people that they don't have to ask for permission to use those public spaces. We've all invested in them. We've all created these places and these spaces, these sidewalks, these, these um, parks, these, these open areas, but we don't know how to engage with them. And so using arts and cultural programming skills and strategies, I get to bring those into these spaces and figure out how to, in to engage that energy. So I talked to you a little bit about chairs, music, and film. Those were the three strategies that we used to totally bring this district back to life. When we took it on, 87% of the commercial real estate on that block sat empty. My first choice, my first option or skill, we bought chairs, Adirondack chairs, 30 of them. Every morning, I'd have my husband and my building manager drag those chairs out, and I said, don't put them just in front of our building. Drag them all down the block and just put them into little gatherings of twos and threes. For the first three days, we began to see people's pace slowed as they were walking through our district. Of course, they were looking at the chairs like, who put that there, and why should I sit, and I don't know, and who and where, and <laughs> that was okay, you know. It was quite the fun social experiment. <laughs> By day seven to 10, they were sitting in the chairs. They were, they were utilizing the chairs, walking their dogs and taking a break, but again, still waiting for somebody to tell them that they weren't supposed to sit there. <laughs> that chair was just for looking at. By day 15 to 30, people were clamoring for the chairs. 11 o'clock lunch time, they'd be running out to pull three or four chairs together and to sit in them and have their lunch and look up and look at the architecture that had been there for over 100 years, but they had never really taken a chance to take it in or to look at those pocket parks or to look at that square or to look at that empty storefront. By the second month, we had people walking into our office and saying, ah, I hate to bother you, but..." I've always wanted to open a knitting shop, and I see that there's a space over there, and we were armed and ready. We had the lists of the contact information for all the landlords. Some of them even gave us keys, and we were giving tours. We had uh, information from the SBA, or bankers, or the downtown association, the chamber, whatever it would take to get them energized to begin to invest their energy, their time, their soul, their authenticity into this place. Chairs, that's all we used. The second was music. Twice, only twice, did we pay musicians to play on this walking mall. Not on a Saturday, not on a Sunday, middle of the week. People stopping to dance, people starting to look around, bringing their blankets to have their lunch in these pocket parks and watch the music. Why do I say that we only paid for it twice? Because it only took twice and then we had musicians coming to us and again knocking on our door and saying, it's okay if I play music, that's your space. <laughs> play the music. Yeah, but don't I need a permit or don't I need to talk? No, just play the music. It's not going to kill anybody, you know? We started to see music pop up more and more. The third way, film. We bought a cheap projector, a blow-up uh, screen, and we started offering film in that little empty square coffee shop right next door to the square that used to close every day at one o'clock. Why? Because there was nothing going on then in that district. They started staying open later. Next thing you know, they were staying open until nine or 10 o'clock because we had our films and offering free popcorn. They began to thrive. By the end of our first year, we'd gone from 87% down to 13% vacant retail spaces. We, shot, we saw knitting shops, bookstores, coffee shops, galleries, all of those things. None of them we curated. 
We let the community curate them for themselves, but we provided the creative placemaking energy to redesign that space. And how exciting. And how many people would come up to us and say, why are you doing this? You don't gain anything. From it. We all gain when we creatively placemake, right? We all create a stronger, more um, connected community when we create those gathering places that we can share our ideas and our thoughts and our dreams and grow our community. Did you know that last year, the investment made by the National Endowment for the Arts in our country returned a $60 billion economic impact? Did you know that the Idaho Commission on the Arts has a $2 million a year budget. And last year, that $2 million of investment in our state had a return of $62 million. That's a 31% return. I mean, come on, where are you gonna get that, right? <laughs> and most of it was just energy and excitement and investment of people into place. The other example I wanna tell you of, of uh, creative placemaking was when I was young here in Coeur d'Alene, and uh, it was through my mother, and it's where I really think I began to learn this process. So we had just moved back to Coeur d'Alene, Hayden really, living in, uh, out by Avondale. And my father was an avid golfer and on the board of directors for the uh, golf course at Avondale, and came home one night and said to my mother, uh, by the way, we've taken over the management of the club. And she said, who's we? <laughs> and they needed to try to figure out a way to get people to connect to that place. Now that used to just be, by the way, a little original log cabin out there on the golf course and neighbors moving in, but neighbors more and more disconnecting from one another. And so on a day not unlike today, with the snow falling and deep, my mother called together people in our district who had skills or had resources or assets, remember asset mapping, to pull them together to create a gathering place for all of us to invest ourselves again and meet one another. The woman across the street used to be an ice capade. She said, Ginny, grab your skates, meet me down at the uh, lake. You're gonna be at Avondale Lake at noon, you're gonna be teaching ice skating. She called a couple down the fairway and said, I know you've taught your six kids how to cross country ski. Grab all the cross country skis, meet me at the clubhouse. She called the woman uh, down the lake who made homemade marshmallows. She called the gentleman who had a horse ranch but also had a horse sleigh and a guitar and had him come out. By the afternoon, we had 85 families gathering together and sharing these experiences with one another in this place that was about to close down because nobody knew how to use it. And when they gathered and came together, they themselves began to say to themselves, you know, it might be nice if we had some weddings here sometime, or what if we did this, or what if we did that? And they sat back and let the space expand upon its own. That day is still one of my most favorite childhood memories. Ice skating, driving around in a horse-drawn sleigh and singing songs, making homemade marshmallows, but most importantly, gathering with people. Creative placemaking allows the opportunity for us to gather and for us to share. And when we have those shared experiences, we take them back into the veins of our city and we continue to expand upon the idea of gathering together and sharing these experiences, not unlike this today. And that's why creative placemaking is so important to what we do. So I'm inviting you all to leave here today and to become a creative placemaker yourself. Asset map your neighborhood, the district that you work, your town, and figure out how you can make those places that you drive by or see or encounter, and you say to yourself, you know, somebody oughta. I'm challenging you all to oughta. Thank you.